done so now I'm start I've just started the recording all right so you will get the recording from this point onwards and you will get assignments quizzes in the LMS and then there will be a project work if you really done your uh, really do your quizzes well then you get to work with the real-time project and you get a certificate and there will be a 24 by 7 support uh, email support okay let's be clear in this so it'll be an email uh, 24 by 7 email support in case you are really stuck then we will have to do a desktop uh, kind of uh, we'll take a remote desktop for your machine as well as you will have uh, we will take a look at your exercises inside the cloud labs all right now <clears throat> there is uh, something called uh, no big data alumni where you have we keep on posting jobs and we keep on uh, stay connected with our alumni all right so today's uh, topic of discussion is understanding big data and second part is Hadoop architecture all right so we will go into the details of both the things to get today all right and we'll keep a discussion uh, we'll keep it in a discussion format a little bit about myself I'm Sandeep Kiri I did my graduation from IIT Roorkee in 2002 afterwards I worked for a company called DE shop where our data was so big that we could not transfer it over the wire so our data used to come either in the ship or in in a flight okay so now you can you can think of think of the way big data changes the mode of operations normally the data transfers via wire but in our case we had to transfer it over via ship or an aeroplane okay so every week we used to get data from new york and other data centers and we used to do some amount of churning so we had a 10,000 node cluster in 2002 when people were not aware about big data we were actually churning it so that was um, that was that was a brief time at D show for three and a half years and afterwards I worked I, I started a company called tbits global where we built a document management system sort of a document oriented database like mongodb but for enterprises all right is being used in power plant construction at a number of uh, companies in india as well as in australia then in 2012 i joined uh, joined a company called inmobi where we i built a recommender for them after churning 200 terabyte of data after Inmobi, I joined Amazon and where we built high throughput systems for Amazon.com. Okay, so a system where which was kind of a platform, we built, I, I built a platform where which, which is distributed and is for stream processing for internal consumption. So that platform is being used by multiple machines, multiple systems. All right, so basically uh, that there was a need of uh, doing a lot of stream processing at Amazon that's what I worked upon other than on the detail page all right so that's about me in today's class we are going to talk about these topics basically two parts understanding big data and second part understanding Hadoop all right so let me let me ask you before I tell you the answer let me understand your point of view exactly what do you understand by big data? What do you understand by big data? Karthik says petabytes of unstructured data. All right. Suresh says large volume. Large volume. Deepak says, uh, Deepak says, uh, very very large amount of data. Krish, uh, Karthik says, coming from different data sources. Lloyd says, massive amount of different forms, which cannot be processed by uh, RDBMS. Brilliant. Richard says large amount of information in the system and Jairam says collection of structured and unstructured data 
Sravan says huge amount of data in terms of velocity and variety. Okay, and volume. Huge amount of unstructured data that cannot be handled by traditional tool that is Tushar. Data in several formats that Bima. Great, great. David says massive amount of different types. Huge amount of data across wide variety that cannot be processed. That's Rajesh. Data bigger than 1 TB, which is difficult to manipulate due to volume, ver veracity, etc. Brilliant. That's, that was Nandini. Sanjay says large amount of uh, multi-structure data. Brilliant. Jairam says which cannot be processed in normal RD RDBMS. Brilliant. Pratap says massive amount, massive amount of unstructured data. Unstructured and unstructured data. Structured data. That's Pratap. And... Beam, all right. Yeah. So Bima says even streaming videos does it count? Yes, it does. All right. Sanjay says with high ve uh, incoming velocity, and Sean says large data at speed. Brilliant. Brilliant. Ravikant says large large volumes of data which cannot be processed by single traditional system. Arun says voluminous amount of structure data. Brilliant answers. Almost you guys have some uh, summed it up. Uh, let me again repeat. So we will stick to a big data definition, which has been accepted by a couple of good projects like Hadoop and other other projects. Okay. So the definition is the data of very big size that cannot be processed using usual tools. And to process such a such kind of information, we require we require distributed architecture. The data could be in any form. It could be structured, unstructured, or semi-structured. Okay. So whatever is whatever is your problem, if you require distributed architecture at any point of time, then your data or your problem is big data problem. All right. So, all right, Himansu is also saying the same thing. Brilliant. Now, moving ahead. So, here there are two, three things. First, we need to understand what does it mean by our, uh, archi distributed architecture. Second is, what does, what does it mean by distributed and, un, uh, sorry, structured and unstructured? So, these definitions we need to be very clear about. Okay. And we will also understand what, what made it happen so that why we have so much of data second we will also discuss that when do you identify how do you identify that now i need a big data why can't we solve the problem by using better machines okay so it's a common misconception that we will go into the details as in why is it that distributed architecture is the only solution all right so we'll talk about all of this so first data variety structured unstructured and semi-structured we will be very very clear in terms of definitions we call a data structured if we know what are the fields in the input as well as we know their data types in case we know about the fields but we do not know the data types, then we call it semi-structured. Otherwise, we call it unstructured. So structured means we know what are the fields and their data types. But in semi-structure, we know what are the fields, but all are in a string format or, or are in binary format. We do not know their data types. So this is a data variety. Okay. Now, all right. So, The other definition which we want to be very clear when we're defining, because all the big data tools, all the tools which you hear about all the time, if they are not distributed computer, distributed computing based, they are not really big data tools. Okay, they are just being a good good at PR. That's why they are being counted as big data tools. Otherwise. Every big data tools have to be distributed computing based. Whether all the tools which we will discuss in these sessions and any tool that we talk about 
under NoSQL, all of those tools are distributed computing based. Okay. So, in distributed computing, a group of networked computers interact with each other to achieve a common goal. Okay, so when we connect computers together to achieve a sing single goal, then we call it a distributed computing. All right. Second is the when we talk about distributed computing, it means since we have made multiple computers like this so data will be stored in multiple machines which means one of the most important premise to understand is we will take data to the code co code to the data instead of bringing bringing the data to the code why because data is really huge and it doesn't make sense to carry the code uh, uh, to carry the data for the code like for example when we did our normal programming what we used to do we used to connect to the database bring the data churn it and then put it back that's that's like bringing data to the code which is like bringing bringing a huge log to the to the x okay so in one of the important aspect of distributed computing is to bring code to the data rather than carrying the data all right now so whether it's unstructured or structured there has been always tools to process those okay the most important part of big data is not the new forms or structures the the thing is the most important part of big data is no matter what kind of problem are you solving whether structured or unstructured no matter what kind of problem are you solving if you require distributed computing at any point of time then you are solving big data problem all right so bima's question is are there any new formats of data other than conventional data data type we heard about we heard in programming language so when we talk about data type everybody can invent their own new data types so everybody can create new data types all right movies mp3s new kind of mp3s and all that so we are not really when we talk about big data we are not really talking about new formats of data we are only talking about every kind of data which cannot be processed using a single machine and for which you require multiple computers to solve the problem okay data is data no matter how we keep it all right make sense abima so tushar is saying uh, we say pictures as unstructured but we store them blob so blob is unstructured data big large object we don't know what's there inside it we have to load it parse it and then we'll know it all right tushar does it make sense so the way blob is stored we also store in the blob every, everything all right so <clears throat> there is a header in the image to understand the header we have to parse this binary and then we have this all right now sanjay's question is is it absolutely necessity for a distributed architecture for big data can't we have super computer chan brilliant question so i'll, I'll keep this question a uh, little uh, separate and let me keep a notebook which i'll share with share later okay let me just make the notes notes for 29th 29082015 and at 30 pm all right so this is a brilliant question let me come back to it again so question is is it absolute necessity for a distributed architecture for big data 
can't we have supercomputers to churn big data okay so yes it is absolute necessity when we talk about big data it is by definition that we are considering only the distributed architecture that's as per discussion now the second question which is can't we have a supercomputer churn the data okay that is something we will answer as we go forward because this is this is little uh, something like i need to i need to show you properly all right now jaram's question is what does semi structured and uh, unstructured means okay semi structured let me give you a few examples semi structured means csv file okay in csv file we know in csv file in csv file we know clear, clearly that these are the input fields but we do not know what are their data types okay unstructured may some such as large blog of, blob of text is the data which is which we does we don't know the structure unless we parse it and store it in a structured format all right next question from bimara is do we get different varieties of processing machines hardware or software so not hardware so all this distributed computing okay means only new software hardware remains same okay make sense now yes that's correct tushar's point is can the machine generated logs like apache log or security logs can be considered unstructured yes but if you take the but if you parse them parse those and put them in a structured format okay in rdbms then it becomes then 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 it becomes structured data okay good brilliant questions brilliant questions going ahead all right i'm keeping this question open the first the, the second one this one all right and yeah all right again this is a classic definition which we trying to answer on the big data part it's important to understand these aspects something which we would like to focus on uh, now so first one is volume the data at rest where the problem is how do we store the data problem is the persisted data okay as and when more and more requests are coming more and more data is being accumulated your problem is how do we how do we store this data so in case of a volume your bottleneck is the hard disk okay so for example the facebook is trying to store uh, for facebook has a storage of 300 petabyte and every day every day they accumulate 600 terabyte data okay so basically the their main problem is storage so the such kind of problems where because of the volume because of this problem of storage we realize that we cannot get it done on a single computer no matter what if you have to store few terabytes data you cannot really store it on a single node we will talk about it again so if you have say 100 terabyte data you cannot store on a single computer no matter what even if you stored you cannot even if you try to read this data it will be it will take lot of time second is velocity how do you serve so many request per second how do you process so much of data per second in in real time 
that's kind of velocity so if you have a single machine and single machine is trying to serve the request then what will happen is lot of lot of requests will keep on coming and this machine will not be able to serve to all the requests in a proper time and therefore therefore you will realize that this single node is not solving your problem because of the velocity of data the data in motion right so problem involving the handling of data coming at fast rate such as number of requests being received by facebook so first is the data accumulated at facebook that is volume second problem is when you are accessing facebook at mobile every second every second there is a request going from your facebook mobile app as well as desktop app to facebook so you can imagine now how will facebook handle so many requests per second so for those kind of things they will have something like a load balance system which will be hitting some kind of a database again that database need to handle this humongous load all right now third problem because of which some data becomes big data is variety variety is interesting aspect so when we say variety it's not only the variety of the data it also includes variety of the problem you are trying trying to solve the complexity of the problem you are trying to solve say for example you have got this good data as in the google maps part and what you are trying to do is find the location from one place to another now no matter which algorithm you use it is a very complex process it takes time so although our map size would be maybe say 100 gigabyte that's not big data neither our neither we have to solve this map kind of problem parallelly for for, for thousands of users or or data is not changing that fast so it's not a velocity problem problem is the complexity we are trying to find path from one node to another in a huge graph or huge network of nodes and we are trying to find the path that is a complex problem and that lies under the umbrella of variety similarly if you are given the full archive of all the newspaper and you have to automatically figure out the correlation between one news article and another in different newspapers then even though the data may every day's data may not be that big okay maybe hardly hardly even if i i download the data from all the newspapers the data might be very small but because of the problem at hand the complexity of problem at hand finding similarities between two news articles because of the complexity of the problem and complexity of the data we call the problem as variety we cannot generally solve such kind of problems on a single node okay so you will you will realize that lots of problems in in big data space or any data space becomes difficult as and when our our complexity grows okay so finding uh, recommendations for example is a complex process it cannot be solved in a reasonable amount of time on a single node so bima rao is saying that does that mean that we do not have queue concept but process all chemic all incoming messages at the, at the speed they come in they have queue concept and the problem is that the queue itself when we talk about a huge scale the queue will become such a huge if you do not process at a proper rate if let's say let's imagine that you build a queue the queue itself as a data structure or uh, you know the 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 software will have to run on multiple machine to handle the incoming flow of the requests okay so you will have to do a lot of lot of distributed computing if you have to handle the number of requests facebook handles you will have to do something like dn dns load balancing i mean there are there are 
n number of things to do in case of variety all right though everywhere there is a queue there are queue concepts everywhere but to process that queue to run that queue you cannot do it using a single system and that's where you move to distribute computing all right now next question is also is big data about postmortem of existing data or analysis of live data too okay so both it is about both so the live data analysis of live data is comes under velocity postmortem is uh, comes under volume all right Is, is the variety clear volume variety I have removed veracity and value because those are like uh, I, I don't find them sensible okay just for the heck of changing definitions people have done that for their uh, press releases nothing more than that so I'm just focusing on these three aspects All right, good questions, brilliant questions. Next question from Karthik is that when you give example of Facebook for each request processing, does it mean that Facebook does not use normal database? No, they don't. Okay. Okay, because the kind of data they handle is at such a scale that neither the problem of velocity nor the problem of storage can be solved using a normal database all right like in case of amazon most of our data i i refer to it our because i was there for a brief period like one and a half years so yeah so at th there also only some piece of data where the transactions were far more important only that piece of data we kept in Oracle. Rest of the data was in NoSQL. All right. So even at some places, uh, most of our data at Amazon was in no, our internally built NoSQL. Now, question to all of you is how many bytes in a petabyte? I'm sure everybody knows, but just to keep everybody, uh, you know, on the same page so how many bytes are there in a petabyte data great great most of you have guessed it correctly yes now there is a question i would like to answer that all right let me yeah it is around 10 to the power 15 okay so a petabyte is 1024 times 1 terabyte and the way you can remember is this way so kilo mega giga tera peta exa zeta yota and everything is 1024 multiple of the other one all right and one byte is 8 bit and can store 256 states brilliant all right now we have got a good question from uh, Sanjay Tandon. Now, which of these variables, volume, velocity, or veracity, is most influencing factor for big data, or does that depend on problem scenario? So, I will say it. It all depends on 
problem scenario okay for some people when they start analyzing their data they realize that they were able to store that data on a single machine they just bought eight terabyte hard disk and connected them onto a single computer but when they started solving their problem because the data was complex it took them it, it, it could they could not do solve it using reasonable amount of time okay so all these three whether volume velocity and variety all these three are equally prevalent so we cannot say that one is more influencing than the other all right <clears throat> make sense to you now here is a question to all of you so now we know a petabyte is 10 to the power 15 bytes okay and we know, we know that one petabyte is 10 to the power 15 bytes and we know what is big data big data is about distributed computing now my question is is one petabyte big data if you have to count just the vowels let me just take a simple case scenario every day let's say you have to count number of vowels in one petabyte data can you do it without a distributed system can you do it on a single computer anyone brilliant brilliant set of answers okay so let me first uh, okay let me take this question uh, in the queue there is a question from my uncle. all right and then i talk about so lloyd says no you cannot shravana says no you cannot himansu says yes but if you ha have you ready to wait for few days or weeks depending on the machine power so I said every day that was a keyword so effectively you are also saying no also a question that you need to understand um, that's something which will matter a lot that it is not the machine power in terms of CPU which would matter okay it is mostly at what rate are you able to read data from a single machine uh, or sing from hard disk okay now there's a good answer from tushar tushar says that i think storing one petabyte itself uh, would be first challenge good good so bimara says that bimara says that uh, even mainframes do not have that kind of capacity that's correct now sean is saying yes if i have all day to give the result so the thing is you can't do it even a single day okay tushar is saying so i don't a single machine i don't think a single machine can process that amount of data that's correct all right so yep bimara says until now at least okay so if you think about petabyte it's nothing but thousand hard disks or maybe you can say 500 hard disks if you have two tb hard disk then it's just 500 hard disks okay so all right shavna says the process and analyze it will take in terms of days i believe Tushar is also saying that distributed computing. So Pratibha is saying break it into small chunks and compute. 
correct but uh, yes that's a good point so we can break it into small chunks and try to find out the vowels and for vowels you don't need to do any computing you just need to read the data from the disk from end to end and that's it right you don't have to do any kind of a special computing it's like scanning the data from left to right that's all we are just counting number of vowels, which is like we are maintaining five integers. That's all. Now, question is that can you do it using single machine at any cost? Because there, here, it's not your CPU or RAM, which is the bottleneck. The first bottleneck would occur when you try to store this data. Where would you store this data? Second bottleneck will occur when you try to read the data. Hard disks are extremely slow. slow. Okay. Rajesh says that even indexing will not help. So Kanaga says that no, it's not possible. It will be time consuming. Good. So uh, Sangeeta says, is load balancer a single system? Brilliant. So a load balancer itself is generally a multiple itself load balance. So the load balancing starts at the domain name. When people are looking for resolving your name, they will get different different IP addresses. Okay, and that's how you balance a lot of load parallelly. All right, so <clears throat> now next question from Mayank is so if we are counting so many vowels and we store all the information in single node. It would be prone to lose the data that's correct so we'll have to maintain multiple copies of it billion so yes so what all you are saying is that so with so all all Mayank is saying that we will have to start with keeping a backup and that's where we realize that we cannot do it using a single machine and we'll have to build our own distributed system so Vidya is saying would it come under distributed definition when you have to use 500 hard disk so if you have 500 hard disk in 500 different computers connected together is a distributed computing and you start sending the code to the data rather than trying to bring all the data to a single machine that's what counted in the distributed computing all right all right brilliant set of uh, discussion now coming back to the question which i've left already here uh, this is the question i had left and there is one more question above so what kind of database do we use is used by e-commerce website to handle various forms of data okay so so mostly if the we are talking about kind of amazon okay our most of the data most of the data was in our in-house built nosql okay but for some data we were still using something called oracle there were uh, specifically specifically transactional data okay so such as such as the payment systems all of those things used to run out of oracle while everything else was in our own nosql database a distributed database which can store everybody's data and without people have to worry about uh, distributing themselves lloyd is saying if we go with distributed computing does it mean we need bigger network pipes good question good question so so most of the distributed computing architecture does evolve around revolve around a lot of data transmitting in the network so it does it does but that's not something you can do much about always any network uh, any every organization try to establish best possible networks available that's not something you change okay but what you change is instead of transmitting data in the network you try to get the work done on the same machine where the data is lying so instead of trying to increase network pipe size you try to get work done 
near the data itself rather than trying to transfer it all over to some other machine where your code is calling it now that's where the problem gets interesting and and complex how do you send your day code to multiple machines to get the results all right so this is where the things get interesting and you will understand that this is where Hadoop and all of this distributed architecture comes into play Shravana is saying that I'll try to be very brief because it is going to be a very tough question to answer it right now. Why the transactional data handled by RDMS? Why not NoSQL or Hadoop? Okay, so I will answer it briefly. That when you have distributed computing, okay, so your data is distributed across the network. So always you you go for eventual consistency meaning data will be consistent eventually okay and you do not go for a strong consistent cons a strong consistency i'll i'll present a case in in case of edge base that how did companies fail badly and why did people need to move out of uh, existing transactional system like rdbms in order to support the load Okay, so most of the transactional systems were built around very strong consistency. So when you require the strong consistency, then you go for a not you go for RDBMS because none of the distributed computing products, be it NoSQL, be it Hadoop, be it anything, they cannot guarantee strong consistency. Because if they try to guarantee strong consistency, they will end up doing everything on a single computer and not utilizing all the computers, right? So instead of doing it parallelly, they'll have to get everything done sequentially. That's where that's where things get complicated, and that's where people prefer all the transactional work to be done by the classic standard systems rather than getting it done through Hadoop, Cassandra, MongoDB, or or any other systems we'll study it in detail when we when we talk about when we talk about the web server we'll study this in details all right this this will be cover this we will cover in couple of sessions which is uh, you, you will understand this why do we why do we need for transactional why do we still need rdbms so wherever you need strong consistency you go for rdbms still all right or you go for something like edge base which is strongly consistent not eventually consistent okay Arun's question is can data be transmitted between NoSQL and Oracle of course it can be using we will talk about a tool called scoop Sanjay is saying could does cloud computing automatically qualifies to be distributed computing no okay so the question here is that is cloud computing qualifies to be distributed or not answer is no because cloud means computer at somebody else's place that's all a cloud means it does not guarantee that there are multiple computers if there are multiple computers are you distributing your workload on multiple computers or how well are you doing the distributed okay so it doesn't qualify make sense sanjay did i make a point next question from nandini is that so in banking system we never use distributed computing we do we do but we we use a different we, we basically try to avoid most of the structure such as relations relations and and transactions we try to avoid those aspects 
okay because the moment you bring in the relations and transactions and the strong structure suddenly you realize that you cannot handle the load okay because that that makes the whole parallel or distributed computing a single node all right did i make sense anandini so we used distributed computing in banking system only in partly okay only only partly where we don't require too much of structure we don't require too much of transactional data or where you have the problem of handling the stored information so we do that we do that in partly for different problems all right now next question from kanaga is is dynamo db in dynamo db it is possible to configure the consistency model but still as you mentioned strong consistency may not be possible though yes so just like in cassandra h base and dynamo db we can configure strong consistency right but the problem is that they do not give you great public key relationships the transactional when we say transactional transactional means not only consistency transactional means all the asset properties okay which means if you want to have a single transaction such that we in a single transaction we want to delete a row update another row and delete from some other table insert into some other table in a single transaction if you try to do this kind of things none of none of existing none of existing no sql database qualify for that all right and even if these systems try to build that kind of transactional definition it becomes impossible to get work done over distributed computing all right so you will always have to figure a way out by using these strong consistency only in certain circumstances you will have to maybe little bit rebuild things and try to measure where exactly can we remove the constraints and get it done all right so although these databases do provide you consistency but they will not provide you great transactions kanaga did i make sense yes so and similar is the answer from kartik right so most of the banking systems not all of the banking system is heavily transactional data more some amount of say archive of the data your last 10 years data that is something you can push to hdfs or you can push to hbase okay but if you are trying to have the right away kind of a data the strong transactional data across the cluster then that is little difficult to implement using hadoop and these no sequels okay so in banks we use hadoop for some kind of analysis like yes not only that but there are many kind of databases in an organization there are many kind of data in an organization where you do not require very strong transactions then you go for hadoop okay all right good next is uh, all, right. all right so great set of questions moving on so yes one petabyte data is a big data all right most of the existing systems cannot handle it handle means two things when i say ca cannot handle it means cannot store it second cannot process it in a reasonable amount of time like let me ask you a very simple question this is something which i found that something which we never consider how much time does it take to read 1 terabyte from a hard disk anyone
Suresh says around 45 minutes. Interesting. Sean says five hours. Lloyd says depends. Uh, Lloyd, just give me a range. Okay. I know that depends is the answer for probably 95, 99.9% .9 of the questions. But I would like to understand on what does it depend upon? All right. Great. Great. So now Shama says maybe a day. Tushar says something around 5 to 6 hours. Brilliant. Himanshu says 6 to 7 hours. Yes. Lloyd, that's why I had clearly mentioned HDD. Okay. So, yes, we are talking about hard disk drive, the magnetic one, not the solid state drives. All right. But yes, your answer is very valid that it takes around one to two hours on a solid state drive. Good. Actually, less than one to two hours on a solid state drive. Brilliant. Now, Karthik says it depends upon the RAM of uh, the machine. No, it doesn't. If you are reading the data, you keep on ignoring it. Don't store it in the RAM. Okay. It wouldn't matter much. Okay. All right. We have got a brilliant question from Kanaga. Let me try to answer it. Probably it will be useful to all of you. Okay. No worries. Rest of the topics, if we are missing out something, we can take again. All right. No worries. So I have a question re regarding NoSQL. So NoSQL does not support joins and all the computations are done in code. How it easy it is to maintain NoSQL and also it does not support transactions. Correct. Correct. So we do not use NoSQL out of ease first. We use NoSQL for handling the load. Okay. Whenever we have humongous load, then only then we use NoSQL. Okay. Next is that these NoSQLs do not support joins. That is true. In most of the cases, yes, they do not support. All right, let me break down your question into parts. So, all right. Now, so NoSQLs does not, most of the NoSQLs do not support joins. So, for example, MongoDB, in MongoDB, joining two tables, we call them collections in MongoDB, is difficult. Same is case with Cassandra. Okay. Now, you do not have to do the computation in the code okay instead you do multiple things first you change the architecture change the architecture of data okay meaning the data modeling strategies are different meaning we try to push all the data into a single table okay we try to push all the data into single table that is first thing and that solves so instead of joining we we keep most of the data in a single table so that uh, we don't have to join second second it is possible to use map reduce to join the data i'm talking in terms of in terms of cassandra and mongodb okay all right. So the computations are not really done in the code. Okay. Most of the computations are done using these kind of concepts. Yes. But for lots of applications, you end up doing lot of, lot of computations in the code. Okay. So these are the two answers. And th next is that how it easy it is to maintain NoSQL. It is more difficult than more difficult than RDBMS. Okay. So the the truth is again I'm coming back to the same point. Truth is that people do not use 
no sequels out of joy of programming they do it in order to support humongous load okay humongous load you will see a case study where we will talk about a case study where a, a developer starts with an rdbms and as the data as the load grows as the load grows the whole database evolves into something which cannot support transactions which does not support relational data and is not heavily consistent there is a there is a good case study which we'll discuss and that was the story with everyone so now you hope you understand that so we, we use nosql not for uh, you know convenience of programming or productivity instead we use it to support the load if something can be done in rdbms and you do not foresee too much of uh, too much of traffic do not get into most uh, nosql and and hadoop it's as simple as that all right so it takes around 6 hours most of you were correct to read data from hard disk drive all right so this is the classic graph which shows the data has been growing at exponential growth since 2002 okay while the analog storage is shrinking the digital storage has been increasing at an exponential rate the reason for the exponential growth of data was first hardware which is smartphones So at one hand, the hardware or, or the mobiles have become cheaper, faster and smaller. And the other hand, the internet connectivity has improved. Along with that, a lot of softwares have come in. Lots of kinds of services have come in, which have made it possible to, to, to build an application, to build things easily and therefore gather the data quickly. So today, when on one hand you have brilliant hardware then you have brilliant network the third one is the softwares and the data available to you is really really quick and easy therefore therefore the big data has become very important it's not a big deal the data is being gathered at a very fast rate and is also available to everyone at a very fast rate you can crawl the internet and download the data by yourself you can crawl youtube and and analyze all the all the videos so basically all these three things combined together has made it possible to have huge huge growth in data the data growth has grown big So Kanaga is saying, Kanaga is saying that is there an alternative to transactional approach in NoSQL? So in NoS, every NoSQL, I mean at least Cassandra and HBase, and they they provide you a strong consistent consistency in a single row, not across the multiple transactions. So you can emulate the transaction using a single row. So, but you will have to really work hard on that to build that kind of transaction. Again, that's not also very, very uh, future proof. Okay, so you'll have to do uh, the transaction system based on some pattern in MongoDB and Cassandra. All right. So, Mank is saying that. I think hardware doesn't matter much what kind of algo you are using makes anything faster so in that algo or approach if you try to get things done over multiple machines then that algo can solve your problem at that point hardware will stop mattering but if you think that you can change the algorithm and can magically make the reading fast from hard disk drive then that's something not true right if you are trying to read one terabyte of data and then trying to make it faster that, that is not really possible right so at a point of time you cannot really do much 
based on your problem you are trying to solve then getting it done on multiple computers all right so hard disk is a problem if you see here i'm talking about reading one terabyte of data data from hard disk drive takes six hours no matter what your algorithm is you cannot write a, your algorithm cannot work without the data right All right. So this fallacy of fallacy of having brilliant algorithm CPU RAM does not work. Okay. Did I make sense, uh, Mayank? no all right now question to all of you is that which components out of these impact the speed of computing cpu ram ram speed disk speed disk size network speed or all of above anyone So, Mayank, are you with me? All right. So, Tushar is saying that I understand that social media has added, added the data growth, but how did smartphone has effectively added the growth of data? So if there was no smartphone, the data growth on social media wouldn't be there. Okay, the data growth on social media wouldn't be that much. Similarly, if you notice that the data being gathered when you are traveling right now, as well as there are so many services starting with uber to food delivery all of those services are working because there is a mobile phone okay so that's why the mobile phone has created if you have mobile phone the more you will share more posts you will you will generate more data by by writing messages on twitter and here and there as well as you will generate will take a lot of photos you will upload those photos so of course the mobile is generating more data than the desktop mobile has more sensors than the sensors available in your desktop that's the reason why mobile has increased it all right son is saying that 70 percent of world access world accesses data internet via smartphone brilliant yes Thank you. Now, Nandini is saying that Nandini is saying that is there one component that has a greater impact than the others? The answer is no. There is no single components. Generally, generally, all of them are important. I have seen some problems where disk speed becomes a problem. Okay. So I have seen some problem, problems when disk speed, be, be, speed becomes a problem. Sometimes disk size becomes a problem. Sometimes network speed becomes a problem. Sometimes RAM becomes a problem. Sometimes the rate at which we are reading from RAM becomes a problem. And sometimes CPU becomes a problem. But in, in this, the, the, the one which becomes quickly the bottleneck is the RAM, which is memory C. C, uh, sorry, the B is probably the one which you will encounter most. All right, B is something which you will encounter most. So the answer is, yeah.
but this, I- interestingly although we have been taught in all of our discussions you know we saw this ad about pentium 4 probably that was the most impactful ad people had ever heard and they sold the idea that they sold the idea that the is the processor which makes things run right but the truth is processor is hardly the bottleneck and probably this is what mayank was talking when uh, he was talking about algorithm the thing is a uh, processor is hardly the bottleneck it is generally if if some program is taking 100% cpu on a processor uh, which is very low end the chances are the same program will take 100% cpu in the pentium 4 or the real one core 2 duo or whatever reason being that algorithm might be having some sort of a bad code or bad algorithm such as the infinite loop an infinite loop will take 100% CPU no matter which CPU are you using so so out of this CPU is probably the last priority nobody has got a problem where CPU got 100% but there are situations specifically when you are dealing with variety and velocity you deal with CPU So Bhimara is saying, does the disk size impact? Yes, it does. Okay. It does impact. Okay. So Sanjay is saying, how is disk size related to speed? Now, let's imagine. Good question. Very good question. Let's imagine that the disk is smaller. Now, what you had to do is you had to put on the network. Right? Now, instead of the network became a problem because the disk size was smaller so your disk size became smaller became the bottleneck you moved the bottleneck towards the network but really if the disk was really little more bigger then you could have solved your problem locally instead of handing it over to the network now you understand how does these component impact the, impact the computing suddenly your speed becomes slower the moment you put the data on a network then the speed from reading from a network is slower make sense uh, sanjay yes so it indirectly or directly however you want to say it impacts all right great now when we talk about process when we talk about handling the data these are the four things which are generally considered as we saw in the previous quiz so at least one of these will become the bottleneck all right now coming to the customers of big data now i think this is the right time i can take up the first question now coming back to this question i think uh, i don't remember who asked it all right so coming to this question now what does supercomputer have does it have bigger hard disk bigger cpu bigger ram what is it that it has okay and how much how much difference it plays so let me let me put the statistics clearly the supercomputer the supercomputer of 2002 was slower than your mobile phone the mobile phone which is there in your pocket right now all right a supercomputer is hardly few times faster in terms of cpu and ram but is not really too much faster than your computer computer when it comes to the hard disk drive hard disk drive is still the same okay so so maybe a supercomputer is 10x faster in terms of cpu or, or and ram but the disk space and disk size is hardly hardly maybe 5x than the normal data center computer 
all right so now when we are talking about thousand times processing when we're talking about one petabyte data if you think about even supercomputer will not be useful because the bottleneck lies in disk read write bottleneck lies in other aspects also when the variety of problems arises even the supercomputers will not be able to solve the problem because if you just connect if you just connect two computers together the pro processing ability overall multiplies by around four times because you got you got bigger computer so you got dual cpu you got dual ram and you got dual network and you got to dual disk size okay so but in case of supercomputer that's not that's not something you know multiplied it's only cpu might be 10 times faster network is same ram is uh, uh, maybe few times faster but if you think about adding 10 computers in a network a, a 10 computers distributed network is far far more powerful than supercomputer now it makes sense to you was he able to answer your question Sanjay brilliant yeah great the example of big data customers is as follows so <clears throat> so for web web and e-commerce there are I mean so big data when we talk about big data means we have got we want to solve really big big problems and those kind of big problems are available in every kind of verticals and every vertical is awakening and is starting to use new generation of tools and is trying to capture more and more data up till now they did not realize the value of data and whenever they computed the value of data divided by the expense expense always took over they realized that storing customers information is not at all useful until now when the when the cost has gone down because of the new generation big data tools the cost of storing and processing has gone down not everybody can afford a supercomputer but everybody can afford 10 computers network now when the cost of storing the data has gone down and people have realized that they can derive a lot of value because brilliant algorithms are available then probably every sector is moving into big data every sector is first trying to capture more and more information as well as trying to uh, consolidate the data they have all right now in web and e-commerce the classic example is recommendation engine we'll go into the details uh, quickly next is the search quality when people are searching at amazon they need to they, they build their own search engine really well similarly other people like ebay flipkart and all other e-commerce companies have to do the search engine really really well similarly if even if you are an enterprise in, in an enterprise world even though the data you are searching is small you might realize that if you are able to build a great dictionary then you will be able to provide a great search quality next is the sentiment analysis that we'll discuss later the other thing is a b testing that is something which is great greatly done by amazon as well as google what is a b testing a b testing means testing your product on a small set of data and based on the response of the users you realize that you you basically measure whether to launch a, a product or not for example the design which i did for amazon we launched it only for 0.1 percent users or 0.01 percent users we launched it for the first time and then we observed observed for say few weeks 
that how many users are buying using my new website okay so new mobile web app which i launched at amazon we ran it for only very small percentage and we realized that it's going good so we increased the percentage of users so more percentage of users were seeing my website my new design okay and that's how that's how we tested it over 6 months and we kept on increasing the percentage traffic to the new design and as a result uh, for example after i left amazon after 6 months of it then the newer design came into production at at amazon uh, amazon india not in globally but that might dial up so the, so basically the idea of a Uh, analytic uh, ab testing is that you do not take the full risk you launch that launch every small product every small product in phase wise manner okay so to to do this kind of an a uh, testing to do a kind of a great testing you generally require a, a big data tool you generally require a tool which can which can handle so many requests parallelly and also do a randomization next is that in telecommunication the telecom sector almost every telecom sector has a requirement of big data there is no denying for any telecom Uh, i mean telecom is probably the biggest consumer because they already have this kind of data and they are suffering with it so they can do a lot of things using big data like customer churn prevention they are already doing it actually and doing the network performance optimization doing a call record analysis and and using data to predict failure okay if you know the past history of failures you can predict that these are the circumstances in which the network might fail so max question is did flipkart's big billion day ruined due to not using hadoop or any such system or data tools yeah so basically basically uh, i don't, don't really know their story what exactly happened they have huge big data infrastructure probably it was not done correctly ravikant's question is what is customer churn prevention customer churn prevention is stopping the customer leave you if you can pick up if you are a telecom company and you analyze that the customers whenever they left you whenever they re- raised a request to switch to another network if you analyze the history of their calls history of their how much time was their phone in network and if you analyze all the people living in the same locality and having their connectivity durations if you can figure out you can easily figure that out that what exactly is the cause of concern of people leaving your service just based on the data you do not have to ask them to fill in the forms you do not have to ask a leaving customer that why is it that you left because that's not the great way of doing it he will get irritated instead what you do is you re- analyze how many calls this customer made to our customer support if if the customer made many requests then it's obvious that that your customer support system is not great so those kind of things you can quickly analyze and do a customer churn prevention by by taking uh, next time by predicting that this kind of customers might leave okay all the you do an analysis that these are the kind of customers who are leaving you you can do uh, analysis and then you can you can try to avoid all of that sanjay is saying that in ab testing can we launch multiple versions or type of the same product but still measure the success so which type 
which version is most hit yeah so yeah that's how we what we do is so it's up to us the a b testing tool will decide how many percentage of users will go to a and b and then measure the success in terms of how much time did they stay on your website did they buy anything or not and based on the buying behavior we say that whether a is successful a means the existing one okay b means the new one so we are computing a slash b and a b testing is something which comes from treatment and uh, what do you call the in it it comes from a b testing comes from medical background where they used to test uh, test the medicines on on animals and on people to see the effect of a medicine we they give pacifier to some people they give real medicine to some people and see whether pacifier has any impact or normal medicine and how well it did all right now max question is network performance optimization so if they can figure out their pattern of usage of the network that during night time this is the perform this is the kind of usage is there similarly uh, they, they also figure out that these are the higher density areas where there is more requirement of the network so similarly they can do the performance optimization all right Next is the government. Government can do fraud detection and cyber security warfare and do the justice. There are lots of things that in government that are using big data, including our Aadhaar card in India. Similarly, in healthcare and life sciences, health information exchange, gene sequencing, healthcare improvement, drug safety. Healthcare is another big sector where everything they are like blessed earlier they waited for a bigger computer to come and figure out dna patterns right now all they require is a, a basically the, they already have started moving their data to distributed computing and and capturing all the information on distributed computing and they started the gene sequencing healthcare improvement and drug safety all right so we will talk about recommendation after the break okay back by 10 14 pm ist all right let me just turn off the my all right we'll be uh, back by in 10 minutes all right you can do the uh, time computation
Hi, so, uh, so can we start now? All right, so let me uh, begin by answering few few questions. First one is the the Aadhaar card example. Okay, so Dusar is saying that that th there is an as for those who are not aware, there is similar to SSN security number. Indian government was trying to build something called Aadhaar card. In that, they were trying to use these big data tools. There, they were using some amount of uh, storage on Hadoop and all. Okay, so. Maybe there was some implementation fault because of this there were duplicacy. So it's not necessarily a problem with big data. Okay. Next question from Bima is that why cannot we distribute the data to tens of distributed cloud environment and process the data and integrate it later? Yeah. We know these days network speed has improved. Yes. You can definitely do that, but again, the moment you can definitely do that, but if you have to do it properly, then you will have to make sure a lot of loopholes. The moment you try to distribute the work to multiple machines, the whole strategy, the whole algorithms, everything changes suddenly. Okay, and to do get it done effectively, take a lot of work and take a lot of engineering to to prop, solve it effectively okay that's why instead of reinventing it makes sense to build your own uh, in, it makes sense to use the Hadoop kind of environment all right Bima is that what your question was did I make any sense So Bima's question is, can you explain the complexity more? Complexity is starting with, if you have 10 machines connected in the network, so which data goes where? How do you make sure that all 10 machines are equally loaded? What happens when some of the machines are out of network? Or some of the machines are up, but uh, are in the network, but the data has got corrupted or they have got down. And how do you make sure the synchronization is happening between all 10 machines. So there are a lot of more complexity when you try to build your own way of getting it done through the network. All right. Then you will realize that it's it's equal to saying that although we are storing the data, why are we using database? We could simply store it in a normal file. Okay. In the same way. All right, brilliant. Now, now coming to recommendations. Recommendation is a very good example, and lots of people are using recommendations at a number of places. Recommendation could be people who bought this also bought the, these item. Second is where this with something else so the the pro the thing on the right hand side is more like curated but on the left hand side are the recommendation which have been generated automatically and you would not believe this the most of the sales at amazon happen because of recommendations all right so then the the complex complexity in recommendation goes further where Based on your whole history of movie ratings, it gives you the list of movies which you may want to watch. Okay, so basically, this 
movie recommendation is also taking into account your history all right now this kind of recommendation are easily done using tools like mahat where they have inbuilt algorithm of generating recommendations you do not have to write a single line of code to generate recommendation that's the state of affairs as of today all you need to do is present three column data to mahat saying this user this product this much rating these three value and mahat will generate you its item based recommendation will generate you the rate uh, recommendations as in this user may like this product and this much all right so that's called recommendation and there are many tools to do to do to, to do the recommendations but mahat seems to be most effective to an extent that at amazon also we have taken uh, some pieces of mahat and implemented it all right so so uh, next is the sentiment analysis another big data problem although there are many big data problems but these seems to be the most popular ones and the most oldest one okay sentiment analysis is figuring out the sentiment in public what do what are people th thinking about you using various kinds of signal from twitter from twitter from uh, from facebook from various kinds of groups you gather these statistics whether people like your product or hate your product based on that you basically plot a graph on timeline of various positive tweets negative tweets and then 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 you say that that this is how our sentiment going on in public all right so this is called sentiment analysis on twitter there are many ways to do the most the most common one is using twitter because data is instantaneously available to you and on twitter what you do is you basically gather all the tweets figure out whether a tweet is negative or positive and keep on counting all right so whether it relates to you or not so you only take care of the tweets that are related to you so that's about sentiment analysis the other kind of uh, yeah so sentiment analysis is quite popular that's why i've taken it into the consideration all right there are few common myths which when we talk about big data these are the common myths people have first one is it always means data above in or in the range of terabytes sometimes even few gigabytes problem become big data problem because of because the com because of complexity of the things you want to do second is always about social media does not apply to me no it applies to everyone who has some data which they want to process okay it just so happens that in social media the data availability is instant it will replace enterprise data warehouse edw no it will not replace they will exist they will coexist okay and some part of the enterprise data warehousing techniques will absorb the new set of technology is a buzzword there are no practical application all right next next common so practical application probably as of today anywhere there is a there is a little bigger data everybody is moving it to the big data solution instead of trying to live with those existing ones because as of today the tools are really mature and are really in good shape okay is a new concept no as i told you that even in 2002 we were handling really big data and on the grid will be the future no it's a present is expensive no 
because most of the systems or most of the existing systems you can use it directly so neither on the software nor on the hardware part it's expensive it's only the because of there is a market gap right now that's why there is a there is a demand of people and that's why there is a cost of people is really high right now is only for data scientist or is a magic no it's not only for data scientist is for everyone and is not magic all right so the point number 8 is it's only for data scientists and is a mag or is a magic no it's not only for data scientists all the data scientists are working and most of the algorithms which they are writing they are making it publicly available and interestingly as of today you have got these sophisticated algorithm available immediately to everyone okay so you don't require you don't need to be data scientist to 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 basically do any of this machine learning or these kind of things you can use directly you you can use directly the algorithms written by data scientist and 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 that that means it is no longer a magic for example the there are at least 15 algo different algorithms for generating recommendations you can use either of them all right the point number 9 is we have enough hardware and we do not need more this is a common excuse which i hear but the but big data is not about hardware it's about it's about software okay because it doesn't require you to buy a new hardware second uh, uh, next is that we will build it when we need it this is another myth we have okay so what happens is that if you do not build a solution which has a huge storage and can handle the things you may never tend to store the more information which can be more important to your customers therefore it makes sense to have the ability and then build the solutions all right big data is about hadoop no there are hadoop is just one solution there are many uh, there are other systems also it just so happens that hadoop is the most complete solution all right so so pratibha try reconnecting i have uh, shared the screen all right now there are few questions let me answer first one is do we have an example where big data is combating terrorism in any shape or form there are many systems as of today where they are combating terrorism such as starting with tools like aml which is anti money laundering okay anti money laundering and there are many more which are trying to figure out the ter uh, terror like activities which if can be can be predicted up front all right so next question from mayank is what kind of database is being used by web application nowadays it all depends it all depends if you see that in future if you see that in your in the future you might be handling terabytes of data then you go for a big data solution or you might be having hundreds of requests per second then you go for a big data solution otherwise you uh, mysqls are good enough to handle mysql and the relational databases are good enough to handle decent amount of load all right 
Lloyd question a Lloyd's point is that Hadoop is being treated as data hub for enterprise then why cannot why cannot it replace the EDW so EDW uh, when we say about enterprise data warehousing it stores strongly relational and tr uh, transactional data if there is a need of transactional transactional and relation data then it doesn't make sense to move all of it to Hadoop right although part of the EDW will move to Hadoop but not completely yeah very good point thank you make sense Lloyd so next question from uh, Suresh is what is open data? Is it a big data problem? So a lot of data is being made open. As of today, if you search open source data, you will find even the internet's data people have downloaded and up made it available on Amazon. Okay, so around 500 TB of text corpus from all the website is available on Amazon.com so that you don't have to crawl. So that kind of data is available open source. So to churn that kind of data generally becomes a big data problem. Not always, but it does. So some of the open data is really small. All right. So Sanjay is saying, how can we transmigrate existing data to NoSQL? Either you can use the API provided, every NoSQL provides an API and provides a support for JDBC driver or ODBC driver. So every tool does that. And you can use those tools to migrate. So you can use you can use uh, the tools provided by the individual database for transmitting the data. Okay, if you are on Hadoop, you can use tools like Scoop, which can transfer data from MySQL to HDFS, Hive, or HBase. All right. So Mank is saying it's uh, yeah. You say that it's not about hardware. We are maintaining multiple copies in multiple systems. So there is a very large hardware required. Is this not a drawback? So yes. So here the value of da data is very important. Now, now whenever, whenever you want the backup of the data, you would definitely need to keep it in different machines. All right. So overall objective is to provide a great reliability, great scalability, and providing a great, uh, what do you call, um, reliability, scalability, and uh, ac uh, accessibility. So in order to do that, we will have to maintain multiple copies, and we'll, we'll uh, go into individual example on the only then these sentences will make sense let's take a case of hdfs where we store multiple copies of the file okay it's not a drawback the reason is that we have the luxury as of today to buy more hard disk hard disks are cheaper it's just that managing the data using software is a complex Therefore, the tools, big data tools such as HDFS, the file system, are giving you the ease of storing data without you having to fiddle around. All right. So when you have, you keep on adding data, then from programming perspective, the hardware becomes irrelevant. When you use these softwares like Hadoop and all, the the actual hardware becomes irrelevant. For you, the file is there, whether it's on one machine, another, or whether few machines are down or not. So hardware, in a way, is abstracted from the engineer, 
right although it can never be but most of the problems are are taken away from developer to to the actual hardware manufacturer or or the 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 people who are managing the cl cloud all right with the i'll answer your question regarding the other big data solutions So Karthik's question is that does it mean that every node has duplicate uh, node for the data? So that architecture is different in different cases. In case of MongoDB, the data gets replicated on multiple machine identically. But while in case of HDFS, it's per block based. We'll talk about it in detail. All right. The strategies of backup are different in different systems. All right, makes sense to you. All right, this is a quick slide on salary trends. So it seems that Hadoop still has got really good uh, highest salary amongst all the technology available as of today. So Sanjay is saying, what is the minimum hardware spec for big data? Can I use my current Windows 7 laptop, desktop, or Windows XP to form a distributed network? Yes. So there is a, since Hadoop is written, Hadoop is written in, if you are using Hadoop here, okay, you can use, use it. All right. Just that I think the Windows version is not yet, I think, uh, production ready. Okay, let me let me have a look. So you might have to go for a Unix based systems because that's more comfortable. The I think these guys have come up with a Windows edition. I'm not sure, but for Microsoft, they are providing the windows based solution all right yeah hadoop is written in java so theoretically it can run on windows as well as unix that's a good point yes so the only thing is the script the boot the the all of those things do they run on windows they have made it possible it's just that I'm not sure whether they have made it public or not. They have made it possible, made it work on uh, Microsoft's uh, Azure, and uh, they call it HD Insights. So I'm just wondering whether HD Insights is available for everyone or not. Okay, I've not checked that one. All right. Just give me a second. Right. Just give me a second.
all right i'm back now so any other questions at this point The trend is for global. It's for, I think, US only. All right. So most of the entry level positions in big data domain are into either the big data analysts or big data developers. So for developers, you need to know at least some programming language knowledge about databases and knowledge about the big data tools for analyst you need to know the databases and you need to know about the big data tools such as pig and hive all right so those are the entry level positions so big data admin yes big data admin is a sysadmin position people with a sysadmin background plus knowledge about big data knowledge about how to install hadoop is, is something good for big data admin those are also entry-level positions thank you jaram all right All right, when we talk about solutions to your big data problems, there, there are many, many things that come to mind. First is Hadoop. Hadoop is probably the most complete solution as of today because in Hadoop, it's not only a single component, it's a group of components. It's a group of components. So, uh, Krishna, uh, Karthik's question is, as per statistics, does it mean that the market is more in U.S.? So, the market is there in U.S. as well as in India and, and in other places as well. You just have a look at it. It just so happens that I only picked up the graph from U.S. Or did I pick it from the Europe? I'm not sure. Bhima, Bhima's question is, can you rate Hadoop slash big data demand in India? Oh, I haven't, I haven't checked it. Okay. I haven't checked it for last uh, one month, maybe. Yeah. But the demand is there. If you, if you look at uh, Nokri.com, I had prepared the last graph there was a huge demand in in the domain of hadoop all right have a, just uh, try searching for hadoop on nokri.com in india then you will get the idea all right that will be a better more sensible way of making the call by doing the analysis using these uh, job platforms okay my knowledge may not be that updated all the time all right good so when we talk about big data solutions hadoop is probably the most complete one it's an umbrella term then there are cassandra although spark is part of hadoop uh, umbrella right now okay but spark does not provide a way to store there is no storage layer in spark it, but it can use almost every other database now there is Cassandra. Cassandra is no SQL database. It, it provides you a query language. It provides you a storage and it runs on multiple machines. And it also provides you a way to churn data using a, 
um, basically their query language all right so that means you can to a some extent you can say that cassandra is good for some amount of computing but like in hadoop or spark the way you have r kind of programming language in in spark r or you have this brilliant sql you have these map reduce kind of paradigm in spark and r spark and hadoop that is not comparable to uh, that there is no comparison in cassandra now there is uh, another solution called google compute engine where you put the data in google's infrastructure and they they provide you sql like query to query the data and next is mongodb mongodb and cassandra these are no sql solutions they provide their stories and also a way to do run the logic although mongodb provides you map reduce but there are not many libraries available uh, for machine learning on top of mongodb okay so mongodb is pretty good solution as well as cassandra for, for if, i will talk about in detail where, which one to pick when okay but the most complete big data solution out of all is probably hadoop but in case you are okay with pushing data away into somebody else's cloud and your competency is not in storage or hardware management then you go for google compute engine or azure all right sanjay's question is that our us companies also outsourcing big data projects to india if skills are available i think so they are okay yeah i keep on seeing now and then people calling me for various kinds of roles so yeah lots of companies are actually outsourcing as well all right next is that so we talked about so this this course what we are going to have in next 11 sessions it, it this course focuses on hadoop and spark we will finish all the components that are under the umbrella of hadoop and also talk uh, will run you through an example of of uh, spark all right so let's start with hadoop do you have any questions related to big data before we move on to hadoop no questions all right all right let's start the discussion okay so hadoop was created by dog cutting and mike caffarella who who basically, basically took the inspiration from from google file system google map reduce and google big table and they tried to build, they were building nuts search engine and at the same time they they were stuck at basically while building their nuts search engine they got stuck at they got stuck at uh, the file system level when they realize that either they build their own distributed file system or they try to figure out how would they store such a huge data they were trying to figure that out at the same time google released the papers and they implemented it and that's how hadoop started the name was based on a toy elephant and 
the most important thing probably the most important thing in case of hadoop why hadoop hadoop is hadoop is because of the open source license of apache apache license is probably the most liberal license you can modify a product you can use for commercial use or free so it's probably the most popular and most liberal license of any software so hadoop is powerful it's well supported by by various companies and it's a framework to handle big data there are two th two three companies which provide hadoop such as hortonworks such as cloudera and such as map map r and there is one more company called cubol it's based out of uh, india and then there are few more companies who provide a very good support of hadoop okay so so it's basically very very well supported by people all right these are the main components which are part of the hadoop ecosystem starting with starting with hadoop file system hadoop distributed file system where where everybody stores their data so hadoop distributed file system is one system on which on which the whole ecosystem of hadoop depends upon so hadoop distributed file system is like your nfs network file system where it relies upon multiple computers for the actual storage and for end user or the apis it looks like a single file system for people they don't ever need to know that it is running on so many machines all right so that's the main component of hadoop So my next question is any Indian IT company using Hadoop technology yes and many of them okay yes and many of them I have worked with uh, I mean there are there are many companies actually as of today using Hadoop even the small ones all right so hadoop distributed file system is the main component on top of this hdfs you have hbase and you have a compute engine called yarn yarn is a basically all right so let me let me take a step back so hadoop distributed file system utilizes many computers to provide you this beautiful file system you do not have to get into the details about where is my file okay it provides you this storage which runs using multiple computers simultaneously and providing you a very robust file system all right now on top of hdfs you have yarn yarn makes it possible to so so your file system is made up of many computers maybe thousands of computers so thousands of computers are running together and they have given 80% of their hard disk in favor of hdfs and thus if you sum up all of the, their hard disk and the, and multiply it by 0.8 you will get the total size of hdfs so that's how that's how the hdfs works now we will talk about more details in hdfs but on top of hdfs since we have so many computers we can utilize all of them to do the computation near to the data that's where yarn comes into play yarn makes it possible to run to run the program near to the data on any of the computers okay but yarn is not something for the developers uh, for for the end users or developers yarn is for people who are implementing frameworks 
they write the program which can go to multiple machines and get executed okay for people uh, those who are analysts uh, or the general users they will have to use either either the tools like MapReduce or some higher level tools to get their work done on multiple machines so so when we want to process some file which is stored the file is stored in HDFS so if you want to process that big really big file then we can use MapReduce or maybe we can use spark to do the processing of that file okay and internally all of them are using yarn yarn is like operating system which can manage the resources on many machines so the next component which is of importance is HBase. So Arun's question is how much challenge with regards to migrating from RDBMS to Hadoop from the DB side and the application side. Mostly it's a rewrite. Okay. Mostly it's a rewrite. So keep that in mind. So that there is a if you have an existing application uh, done and you want to move that to Hadoop, most likely you are going to rewrite most of your most of the way you are going to do it. Okay, so th th think through it, understand the technology stack, only then take a make a move. All right, because the architectures of HBase, HBase is probably the most closest one to your relational databases, and the architecture of HBase is fairly different. All right, architecture of HBase, which is the database running on. HD, uh, I mean Hadoop, you, you will realize that the architecture is very different. So Karthik's question is, are MR and Spark are something like framework which provide API for HDFS? So yes, as well as they provide their own paradigm their own paradigm like MapReduce. In case of Spark, there is something called Actions and Transformations. So those you have to code in those paradigms and they make sure that they execute the logic in the most efficient manner on multiple nodes. All right. Good. Good question. All right. So, yeah. This Prithiva's question is: Can we take can we take can we take Q and A at the end of each session, please? Just a request. Yes, that. Thank you very much. So I think I was also about to say the same thing. All right. So let me just take this session of questions. Makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I will follow. It's breaking my flow also. All right, let me take uh, Sanjay Tandon's question. The question is, even though it's distributed computing, these do these nodes computers need to be in close proximity or can they be geographically scattered? They can be geographically scattered, okay? And you generally keep uh, some machines to be geographically scattered in order to have a backup of this cluster somewhere okay all right yes and next question from Karthik was, so again, are MR and Spark something like framework which provide API for HDFS and YARN? Yes. So they do not provide any API for YARN, but they provide an API for HDFS. But 
on top of that they make it even further easier by making it possible to load data properly okay so as you go ahead you will understand that that is not only the api they provide they provide you a lot of things they make sure the logic that gets executed is done near the data all right great now moving on the next topic of discussion is hbase so we talked about briefly about yarn and mapreduce is MapReduce is something that runs on top of YARN as if we are saying that YARN is operating system and on top of YARN there is something called database engine which runs your SQL query. Okay. And similarly on top of YARN, uh, say operating system you can have any kind of compute engines. Right. See, th 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 that's how it happens. So YARN makes it possible for you so you give your you give your components to yarn and yarn will get it executed on multiple machines safely okay now since it doesn't make much sense to directly talk to yarn and keep on getting writing code for even the smallest thing you use mapreduce or even the higher level components all right similarly spark is also using yarn and there are many more tools who use yarn yarn makes sure that resources are available to your program next is the hbase hbase is a no sql data store meaning hbase provides you a really really huge storage having billions of rows and millions of columns all right in case and in hbase because hbase also stores its file the actual file in which these rows and columns are stored they are also stored in hdfs so hbase provides you a little more guarantee of getting work done so hbase is great when you have some sort of a structure in the data while at, while if you don't know anything about your file you may like to store it directly into hdfs but if you want to manipulate data if you want to change data insert data update data then hbase is better than hdfs in hdfs altering data is equal to creating a new file all right so since your progress there since there are many kind of users some of them may not be that conversant with programming and may not be able to write map reduce right away also map reduce is time consuming for those there is an sql like interface that get converted that gets converted into map reduce so you write your code select star from my data do this do that that kind of logic you write using hive and that logic internally gets converted into MapReduce paradigm and that MapReduce paradigm is executed on hundreds of computers parallelly without you having to worry about it. Next is the Pig Latin. Pig Latin is similar to SQL but great for churning big data. Pig Latin works well with with unstructured or semi-structured data and you can use piglatin to parse your unstructured data and piglatin also underlying it is very much like an sql but without so much of structure as in you don't have to define the tables before you start churning the data you can you can use pig pig or piglatin to clean up your data but but in case of hive you have to define your tables up front so that's a one added advantage of pig latin also in case of pig latin you can load uh, you can basically do a lot of optimizations as compared to hive the third is mahoth mahoth is nothing but a list of a li a collection of libraries and this library contains various machine learning tools okay which basically make it possible to to predict do various kinds of predictive analy analysis 
So that's Mahat. So Mahat has many libraries, as I was telling you earlier, that if you have to generate recommendations or you have to do a kind of various uh, clustering, you can use Mahat. All right. Now, when you have a product, also at the bottom, you can see there is something called flume and scoop. Scoop is great when you have to pull data or push data to MySQL. If you want to pull data from MySQL to HBase, Hive, or HDFS, you can use Scoop. All right. And sometimes the the sometimes you want to process the unstructured data, such as uh, such as your movies and and you have to pull a lot of data from various kinds of machines onto HDFS. In those cases, you can use Flume. Flume pushes the data from all kinds of computers onto HDFS. And you can lay out the full uh, translation, I mean, full tra transfer pipeline using Flume. Okay. So Flume is quite powerful tool when it comes to pipelining for moving the data from one place to another. And Flume can handle any kind of structure. Yes, we will use, we will have one one example of all of this. We will do hands on of all of these tools. Along with these tools, we will even go into Spark's detail. And there will be one more tool which we have not listed in this diagram, which is called Zookeeper. Okay, so by the end of these 11 sessions, you will be acquainted with various kinds of tools which are part of the big, big data system. All right, most of the systems, like for example, MongoDB, although not covered in this, the design of MongoDB is similar to Zookeeper. All right. And Cassandra is somewhere between HBase and MongoDB. All right. So you will once you get, go through, we go through all of these. When we go through all of the, these eleven sessions, you will be acquainted with most of the different designs of various applications and how to deal with them. Okay. All right. Now. If you noticed, then we had these many tools, right? We had the file uh, data input, import output tools. We had file system. We had compute engines. We had resource managers. We had databases, and we had analytics tools and machine learning. So your program can be built, will be built using all of these. Let's take a case of my recommendation engine, the one which I built for, for InMobi. That was very straightforward and simple, right? So in the, during that application, my objective was to find the recommendations. So I was using Mahoth for that. Now to use, the, use Mahoth, I will have to build that three column data set, meaning first column will be user ID, Second column will be product ID. Third column will be how much this user likes this product. So my objective would be if I have to get something done from Mahat, I'll have to prepare this data, these three column data. So when I was trying to do the recommendation in Mahat, my data was around 200 terabyte and that needed it churning. So some part of it I wrote in MapReduce. And some part of it, I wrote it in pig. And then I, I, before that, I wrote some part of it using, using my uh, flume kind of an architecture where we were pushing this data from our web servers to HDFS. So basically in a typical project, you might be using more than two to three components at in, in your project, right? Now question arises that how will these tools execute in what order, which one gets executed first, which one gets executed second and so on. That role is played by Uzi. Just like you have Maven and, uh, okay, 
you have maven ant and uh, make those kind, the, the way those build tools work in the same way this uzi runs your tools in a sequence okay so uzi basically stitches things together and get it done over hadoop cluster now you as a user can either use command line tools or you can use uh, any programming language like api or you could use the web based interface all right makes sense to you now talking about confused about high sql on no sql and edge based combination that is sql working on no sql yes so hive does not have any hive does not have any storage okay hive does not provide you a way of modifying data hive is just an analytics tool so it has a query and everything but it does not have so hive hive basically pro whatever query you write that gets converted into MapReduce and executes on on top of hdfs or any other databases so hive is just a querying language which gets which basically converts it into underlying infrastructure so you can use hive to query the data which is there in maybe comma separated format or some tab separated format or in any other format which is lying in hdfs or which is lying in hbase and these hbase kind of databases they provide you a tabular structure so partially your sql can work very well all right did i make sense sanjay good question So Krishna's uh, Krishna, uh, uh, Krishna uh, Karthik Krishnamurti's question is: For querying in HBase, is Hive used? Yes, we can use Hive for querying in HBase. But in case of HBase, people generally write their API and then talk to HBase. There is no other SQL to churn data from HBase. All right. Any other questions at this point? no questions moving on then all right so any questions on hdfs yarn map reduce spark hbase hive piglet in mahat uzi and then flume and scoop any questions All right. So again, let me go back to All 
all right so karthik's question is how can sql interface be like hive be used okay how can sql interface like hive be used so the way uh, all right so let me try to put it here let me try to answer one question at a time good question very good let me try to answer it all right so question is that hbase is no sql data store how can sql interface like hive be used my question is why not okay if you think about sql what is it it's basically is basically given a table it can do various kinds of operations it can do group by it can do filter it can it can execute joins right it can execute joins for you so if you think carefully it is actually very much possible so hive has its own sql which is very much like your uh, normal sql right and hive is basically a compiler which converts any sql query into into a map reduce phases so it can very well be done it's written bottom up only for this purpose make sense to you so basically uh, under the hood uh, sql like interface can be very well done on hbase or any other database just that it will not be able to provide you those constructs for transactions all right all right good good very good set of questions now uh, next question is from pratibha does hdfs has a specific format no hdfs is like your normal folder structure i can show you quickly and probably that is the best way to understand what does an hdfs looks like so this is a browser interface for hdfs on our cloud labs okay under the hue so if you go into this file browser this is this is you can see that these are the folders and this is hdfs you can go into the folder you can you can look at a file okay so this is hdfs this file system is hdfs there is a browser based interface which is doing something okay so which is talking to the actual hdfs and displaying you the data so this is hdfs now it can basically support any kind of file make sense to you just that hdfs is running on multiple machines simultaneously in order to provide you huge storage all right now suresh is saying that can you explain a bit more into spark okay into spark as in here so spark also makes it possible to process huge amount of data okay so parallelly it utilizes multiple computers in your network to get the operations done 
anything you want to process you can get it done through so many computers if you had say 100 computers and you want to process data on 100 computers you can use spark and spark makes it possible to represent the data represent the data in a data set which is distributed across the the full network so a data set is or you can think of the basic style of spark is to represent a big array and this big array which spark provides you is is distributed this array first few elements are on one computer second few elements are second computer and third few elements are third computer and so on now when you execute something you don't have to worry about where it gets executed that's the duty of spark to make sure it runs near to the data so spark does not have any storage it relies on hadoop for storage but it has a computing platform it ha it has a compu computing paradigm okay now lloyd's question is can spark totally replace mapreduce i think my political answer would be it's a good question okay so i have written couple of uh, interview questions you may like to go through uh, on spark where is the spark All right. This second one is a little far more difficult, as in more technical. Uh, the first one is more uh, theoretical. All right. So here there is there are re really good reasons on Spark. Okay. Now coming back to Lloyd's question, can Spark totally replace? totally replace MapReduce? The answer is, I don't think so. But you never know what happens next, okay? For most of it, it has replaced MapReduce, okay? But some, in some cases, in some cases, MapReduce is still very relevant, okay? If you are okay with batch processing, so the, the biggest difference between MapReduce and Spark. Spark and MapReduce are competitors. Spark has recently come in while MapReduce has been going on for some time. The biggest difference between MapReduce and Spark is MapReduce is batch oriented. Okay, you create your full program, compile it, bundle it, hand it over to MapReduce and then let the MapReduce complete and then you will go and check. So that's how it happens in case of MapReduce. But in case of Spark, the whole data gets loaded in real time and you can process data in real time. So the difference between MapReduce and Spark is the real time aspects. The only downside of Spark as of now is it consumes a little bit more memory than MapReduce and there are chances of failure. Okay, so in some cases, in some use cases where batch wise processing is better, in those cases, MapReduce is still very relevant. Now, Lloyd's question is that how is Sparks? So, just like we have here. If you have this diagram, if you take a look at this diagram, you have Hive, Pig, which runs on top of MapReduce, similar to that, Spark has also come up with Hive, Pig, and other things. So, uh, so in case of the Hive, uh, the cousin of Hive on top of Spark is called Spark uh, SQL. Spark SQL is basically a port of Hive. Everything which used to run in Hive runs very well in Spark SQL. All right. Does it make sense to you, Lloyd? Moving ahead. 
Now question from Sarvana is that what are the languages supported by Spark? Spark supports many languages as of now. The on raw level, the Java, Python, and Scala. While on the little higher level, it's Spark R, which is a clone of R, and and then Spark SQL on top of it. All right. All right, yeah. So Karthik's question is, in one of the slides, we said Hadoop here, Hadoop and Spark, right? Yeah, it doesn't make much sense. I mean, for this slide, the only reasoning was that Hadoop and Spark were two different uh, tools, okay? And based on your need, whether if you are going going with uh, batch wise processing you might like to use map reduce and if you are want to do it real time you might go for spark okay so earlier it was like two, two separate product but they are the uh, you know spark is under hadoop itself all right makes sense So ideally, what we are saying is we can say things like this. Uh, one in one combination, you can have Spark and uh, Hadoop together, and then the other things. All right. There is another question why there are so many similar products okay all right so good question good question so similar project products let me try to understand so in case of, i hope you are only talking about about hadoop ecosystems right or you are talking about in general like in my no sql as well All right. Why so many similar products like Hive equals to sort of pig and Spark sort of equal to MapReduce and so on. Right. So there is a reasoning behind it. Sometimes it's historical as in uh, earlier people did people built MapReduce and then now people have built Spark. Similarly, Hive and Pig, while Pig is a little bit more efficient than Hive, but Hive was done so that the people who had been working on DBA should be able to, uh, you know, learn, able to churn the data on HDFS quickly. Okay, so for those reasons, Hive was done. So, okay. So in case of Hive and Pig, the, the difference is minor, as in, in case of Pig, you can churn unstructured data, while in case of Hive, you can churn only the structured data very well. But, but in, if you compare MapReduce and uh, Spark, you will find that while Spark is for really fast processing in real time, MapReduce can do things on far more efficiently if done in, for batch wise. Okay, so those are the design differences between various components. As you get more and more into the products, then you will start uh, realizing that there is a difference between one product to another. While Scoop and Flume look like they are similar products, but they are actually far different. Make sense when you go into more details the things will get more clear all right so that's pretty much from 
our side so there is something called cloud lab for real experience so uh, please make sure that you go through the cloud labs and this for students and uh, please go through the login into the console and uh, also have a look at the cluster right now we have a cluster of four nodes so in this this file system as we saw just now it's actually running on multiple machine some part of this folders file is in one machine some other is in another one and uh, we don't have to worry about all of that okay now you can have a look at here you have got hdfs hdfs is running on these four nodes you can see we have got yarn which is running very well we have got map reduce which is running uh, four clients you've got edge base and these are the statistics all right so these are the various tools that are running right now on our cluster so this is uh, the admin interface for using you go here into something called hue and there you can execute your pig query hive queries okay these are the various tables created by students so please create your own folder to start because for the whole batch we generally share a single login uh, yes uh, kanaga please uh, go to no big data's my my courses under my courses you will see So for you, it would be this one. So there will be a documentation. Go through that documentation. It will be somewhere here. Installation instruction is there. And then, okay, just go through that. All right. So did I leave anybody's question? All right. Thank you very much. And those who are uh, who are attending this class, please finish this quiz. At least finish the first quiz, okay? So that you are, we are all on the same page till tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You can read further. All right. Thank you very much. So Bhima's question is, are these tools open source? Yes. Are they secured? Yes. Will bank environment use do they, these tools? Yes. All right. So access to these tools will be to 50 days. All right, Karthik? It will be for 50 days from today. Yeah. For Cloud Labs, it will be 50 days. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day ahead. So Kanaga's question is, will the project be separate after 11 sessions? Yes, there will be a project session. And, and tutorials will be separate. Project is separate and tutorials will be separate. Tutorials uh, in our cl classes, this is probably the only session, session number one, where the most of the ideas are theoretical. In most of our classes, it will be very hands-on. And we recommend all the users to also do the hands-on with us okay so the difference because of uh, tools being available right away it does not make sense to postpone the tutorial or hands-on exercises till the end of the session 
so as in when we keep on explaining each concept we keep on giving you the demo all right so the tutorial will be hands-on sessions will be there in every every session the cloud is made available so that all of you can also try while I'm explain, ex explaining something all right so you don't need any other tool on your local machine not even as of today we have also completely removed the need to install the putty and we have our own terminal here you can see we can just log in from the browser okay so we can just launch hi from here or pig from here all right make sense to you yes you can practice on the so you can also run things like HBase from here, pig from here, everything is available to you. So right now, now we are in pig console. All right. If you want to go to HBase console, we can just go to this. Otherwise, if you don't like the black terminal, you can actually do everything from here also. There is no need of VM, although our installation instructions include the installation of VM, but that will not be required in our case. Sounds good to you? Great. So Jairam, you have to, you can log in into both and check both. Okay. Hue and Ambari are not alternative to each other. Ambari is for sysadmins. Hue is for the, the everyone. Whosoever want to interact, interact with the file systems or any other tool. All right. Thank you very much. Feel free to get in touch with us if you have any questions. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Have a great day. All right. So, yeah. Bye, Lakshman. Bye, Shravana. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye, Arun. Bye, Bhima. By David, by Deepak, by Ganesh, by Himansu, by Jairam, by Karthik, by Lloyd, by Mayank, by Ravikant, Rohit, Sandeep, Sangeeta, Tusar, Vidya. Have a good day.